Hello church. This is the first uh, Sunday of April 2020. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Let me go ahead and read a little bit here of our passage. Chapter 6 beginning in verse 11. We have spoken freely to you Corinthians and open wide our hearts to you. We do not withhold our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my own children, open wide your hearts also. Now Paul's context here is he's writing to believers in the city of Corinth who have a lot of troubles. And all of us deal with sin in our life throughout our life. We have to confess our sins on a daily, hourly basis if necessary. We have to work at avoiding those things which drag us backwards in life and make us less worthy of the Lord. And the Corinthians were sliding a great deal back into the old life that they had before Christ. When we come to Jesus Christ as our Savior, He gives us a new life. The old has passed away, the new has come. Our position is that we are forever children of God. That will never change. Just as you're born into a human family and you're genetically connected to them, so you are born into a spiritual family at trust in Jesus Christ as your only means of salvation. And having trusted him, you're born into his family and that will never change. You have the DNA of God, so to speak, forever. Your position is in Christ, of which baptism is a picture. Dead to the old life, alive to the new. Now, this new life, then, has a new way of living. It has the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, the empowerment of the Word of God. Those are your two power systems by which you can uh, walk with God in time. Uh, you make continual decisions as to which direction you're going, walking with the Lord or away from the Lord. And we know, the vast majority of times, we know uh, the directions we're going, whether they're good or bad. Uh, and we have the Holy Spirit to help us make good decisions from a position of strength. Now, the Corinthians were sliding back into the old life because of false teachers and because of second opinion people. There's always someone who hears what the Word of God says and says, oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's not quite right. Uh, the Word of God is perfect. It proves true in all occasions. And if we want to be rebuked by God, just reject His Word and He will discipline us. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, first of all, to set this up. Because uh, Paul has just gone through quite a defense of himself and in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, now we're in 2 Corinthians, but I'm going to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, to the church of God in Corinth. Anyone who has believed in Jesus Christ is the church. It's not an organized church in the sense that we have denominations. There are no such things for hundreds of years. Uh, we belong to Jesus Christ, therefore we are the bride of Christ and we forever belong to him, and we are the church. We are a saint. God has called us to be his, to be a royal family of God, quite a position. To the church of God who's at Corinth, to those sanctified that set apart, that's your positional truth, what you're born with, sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. Okay, called to be his holy people, in position, we are his holy people forever. And we're called to be what we are, to act what we have become. Together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Now I want you to understand what he says here. He doesn't say, well, you guys, maybe you aren't really believers. He doesn't say that. He's writing to believers. So whatever you read in 1 Corinthians and in 2 Corinthians, he's writing to Christians, not non-believers. His message is to believers. What would be senseless for him to write to non-believers that can't understand a spiritual message? The only message unbeliever needs is to believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. 
And so here we've come to the part where Paul has been defending himself because there's a lot of false teachers that come along. A lot of people want to second guess Paul and whatnot. I mean, because the sins were multiple in the Corinthian church. There were factions. They separated out and kind of formed their own little denominations, uh, you know, type of thing. That's factions, okay? Fighting each other. And of course, uh, there was the incest that was there. There was the lawsuits. I mean, uh, Corinth was a litigious society. Everyone was always suing everybody. And Paul said, no, that's not your life. That's the unbeliever life, but that's not your life, okay? Uh, if you have to go to court, just make sure you tell the truth and uh, you're not trying to rob somebody in it. Uh, but he says, you don't, you don't do what the unbeliever world does with that. And he talks about lots of different things that there are false teachings are involved in, uh, drunkenness at the communion table. Uh, they had a lot of problems. There's no question about that. But they were still believers. And Paul said, your problem is you're listening to the whispers of false teachers who come in and want to gain a gathering, a group of people for themselves. And they want to lead you astray from the simplicity of Christ. What they would like to do, and this is Satan's theme all the time, is that if he can't get you to not believe in Christ, if you've already believed in Christ, well, maybe he could make you religious. You follow rules and regulations that are made by people and still following the simplicity of trusting Jesus Christ day by day. Now, it's going to talk about the simplicity of Christ coming up. And we have to understand that uh, the Christian life is not complicated. You trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Just keep trusting him all along the way. You're in the midst of a, a, a virus problem in the United States. You trust in the Lord. You do what's right. You do the sensible, logical things. You don't toss your brain out. But you trust the Lord also. If you have to be treated... Uh, for an illness or for a virus, well, you do what the doctors say and you trust the Lord. Ultimately, the Lord has us in his hands and as his children, he'll take care of us. So Paul talks a lot about, in 2 Corinthians, his personal relationship with these believers and how much he cares for them. Now, Paul could have said, as many do when they get into situations with difficult uh, people, uh, I'm just going somewhere else. You know, in fact, Apollos left Corinth. He was a pastor there. And he shows up over in Ephesus where Paul is, Paul says, what are you doing here? He says, I, I left, I quit. I'm not going back there. I'm fed up with those people. And Paul realizes there's quite a crisis here. So he writes 1 Corinthians. There's another letter he writes, and he writes 2 Corinthians. And 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians are preserved for us because they have so much good teaching for us. Now Paul, in, in this passage, 2 Corinthians has been defending himself and showing the type of things he's had to suffer in life for believing and being true to, faithful to, Jesus Christ. We're not asked to produce great things for God. We're asked to be faithful. Just trust Christ in all the areas of life. Use his power. Use his wisdom from his word. To do the best job you can where you're at. Now, Paul says, all these things have happened to me. And yet, Paul didn't say, forget you, Corinthians, as Apollos did. He didn't say, I'll go up to Ephesus. Uh, you know, they, they're, they're the center of Christianity the first couple hundred years. I'll, I'll go to Philippi. They really enjoyed the word. Or the Bereans, faithful to the word, always searching the word. I'll go to these other places because they really enjoy the word and, and they take it in. They're responsive to it. New Corinthians, you just, it's just a mess. No, his motive was he loved the Corinthians because they were his brother and sister in Christ. So he never gave up on people. God never gives up on you. There's never a time when he'll toss you aside and say, I'm finished with you. Uh, the whole Old Testament is full of believers who are called great men and women of God who we would have probably given up on because they failed so miserably. But God never gives up on us. Always remember that. Now, in our passage here, Paul says, begins down there with uh, verse 11, we have spoken freely to you. Now, speaking freely to them as he's been teaching them the word of God. He, he, when he speaks, he speaks the word of God. He was intent to make sure that they knew exactly 
uh, what God's Word said, and there would be no question about it. Uh, let me go to Acts chapter 20 uh, with the Ephesians church. He's going by on his way to Jerusalem, and he stops at the Ephesus church, chapter 20, and uh, it really is verse 13 and following in that chapter, but um, we'll start down at uh, verse uh, 19. I serve the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I've declared to you, both Jews and Greeks, that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. Okay, now Paul says, I have house to house. Now, there are no church buildings. People met in houses, and that took place for a couple hundred years and, and uh, get into the, uh, uh, after a couple hundred years, so many of the temples and uh, false worship centers had been emptied because so many people came to Christ. They didn't pass laws. They didn't get legislation taking place, you know, and whatnot. They didn't picket places or whatnot. No, they just kept teaching people about the love of Jesus Christ for them. And they came to Christ and it turned their life around. And so many had their lives turned around. They just didn't have anything to do with the silly idolatry anymore. And, and then the churches used to go into these places, clean them up, you know, take all the idols and all that out and, and worship there. It's a convenient place to worship. But for many, many years, um, and it's still true today that some of the most growing and vibrant churches are house churches, like in China or India, and there it spreads like crazy. The organized churches many times become political organizations and become a part of the politics, and you can't necessarily learn the word of God there. You can learn the word of man, but not the word of God. And so we have... Uh, Paul saying to the Ephesians church, you know, I have, from house to house, I taught day and night, I'd go wherever the meeting was and I would teach the word of God so that you'd have the whole counsel of God so you'd understand what God wanted you to do in life. It's exactly what Paul is talking about here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. We haven't held back. We've given everything we can to you. We want you to be able to walk with God in time and to enjoy your life in Christ. And so we've opened up everything we know. I've spoken to you God's word now and opened wide our hearts to you. Now, this is a difficult passage because of how Americans think of the heart. I love you with all my heart. That's an emotional concept, okay? Although it could be a mental concept because that's really what the meaning of heart is. It's the word cardia, and we uh, use that in medicine and all, cardia, uh, the pump we have, the heart, uh, that pumps blood all over our body. Well, the heart in the scriptures is the thing that pumps information in your mind, circulates information. It's more than just knowledge. There's another word for knowledge. It's noose. Uh, that you just take in information in the world around you to understand it. But the heart is where you think about that stuff and you start to apply it to your own life. Well, how would this work in my life? Or how could I apply this passage? And so you think about these things and that's the heart thinking. And with your heart, you make your decisions in life. Now, many people come to this passage and they say, oh, you know, they're just not emotional enough with Paul. They're not showing their emotion to Paul. That doesn't have anything to do with emotions. Nothing to do with the emotions except in the negative sense. The heart is where you think and make decisions. Let me give you a good example of that. From Romans chapter 9, we have a great passage where it talks about the heart. And uh, uh, Romans chapter uh, 10, excuse me, verses 9 and 10. Romans 10, 9 and 10. You notice what it says here. If you declare or confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you're saying he is God. He is the God who has saved me on the cross. I'm confessing him as my Lord. 
and believe in your heart. Belief is a mental activity. Hmm, okay. He did this, and God says that takes care of my sin. Sins have been punished. I don't have to be punished because of my sins. He who knew no sin became sin for me, that I might become the righteousness of God in him. So he took my sins, and when I say, yes, I believe in your work, not mine, he gives me his righteousness. Now, we confess Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead. Now understand this concept that Jesus is Lord. The Romans had a concept, Caesar is Lord. Caesar is God, and people are always trying to make other people gods. And when the believer said, Jesus is Lord, he's saying, he is my only God. He's the one I worship and I follow. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. So, so what do you believe in? You're believing in some facts. That there was a death, a burial, a resurrection. And the evidence of that, Christianity itself existing, is evidence of the resurrection. The over 500 people that saw Jesus raised from the dead, evidence of the resurrection. You say, okay, there's all these eyewitnesses, and there's not a good refutation of the fact that raised from the dead, except that, well, people don't raise from the dead. No, they don't. But what is hard for God? Is anything impossible with God? God raised him from the dead to prove to us that what he did on the cross was enough for us. We don't need to add anything to it. We don't need to be better. We don't need to do some things. It's all done for us. We can trust Jesus. So, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus, Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You'll have eternal life. You'll immediately go to heaven when you die. There's no purgatory. There's no intermediary stage. If there is a purgatory, if it's said in the Bible, I would believe it. It doesn't say in the Bible. It's nowhere. It's a man-made teaching that helps you to work your way to heaven. And no one is going to work their way to heaven, no matter what they do. So it says, believe in your heart that, he, that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved, for it is with your heart that you believe. That's where the thinking goes on, not just memorizing trivial facts in life, but having information and acting upon it, believing it. And so, for it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, made right before God, declared not guilty because someone took the punishment for you, substitution. And with your mouth, you profess your faith and are saved. Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For as uh, it, it's written in the scripture, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. All right, so there's a, a body of information there of what Christ did for us. And we take that information and we cycle it in our mind, our heart. And we come to a decision. And so it's with a heart that we believe and are saved. So the heart is where we cycle information we have and then we come to a conclusion and act upon it. So let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 to understand this. It says, And open wide our hearts to you. How does he open his heart? Everything he knew about the plan and will of God, he communicated with them. He wanted them to have all the, he didn't hide anything. He let everything out so they would understand and appreciate the work of God for their life. You know, emotions carry us in the wrong direction many times. You cannot live on your emotions or they'll lock you up. They'll give you drugs, bring you down till you start thinking again. Palm Sunday, which this is a Palm Sunday uh, on the calendar anyway. And uh, they were praising and yelling, Hosanna, uh, praise the Lord, praise the one who comes in the name of the Lord, throwing down palm branches as for a king. And this is a triumphal entry. And the same people within a week, uh, less than a week, are going to yell, crucify him. Because emotions never take you in the right direction. Emotions were invented by God as an uh, appreciator, an entertainment center for life. And we get emotional about many different things, and that's fine. But we never let our emotions guide us in life. We let our thinking guide us, and the emotions will follow that and be an appreciator of life. So here we have, 
We have opened wide our hearts to you. We have taught you everything we can teach you. Well, you guys ought to be in some level of maturity by now and teaching other people. But your emotions have hindered you. Emotions hinder many Christians. Many Christians believe that worship is an emotional experience. And of course, what you see on the media is, is everybody swaying and, and, you know, with their hands up, which is fine if you want to worship like that. There's nothing wrong with that. You can praise the Lord in any posture you'd like to, but they portray it as a, an emotional jag. Don't use your brain. Christianity is just the opposite. You must use your brain or you'll always go wrong. But a lot of people get emotionally involved, emotionally involved, and they want an emotional high, kind of like a drug addict wants a, wants a high from his drugs. And if they get really emotional and things are all exciting and, and tearful and all, they oh, wasn't God there? Well, the fact was, God was there, whether you're emotional or not. And maybe you were very depressed, uh, you are very upset about things, and you were worshiping, and all you could do is shed a tear. Uh, you kind of moan in your own soul. Well, God was there also. It's not emotion. It's not how we reach God. We reach God with our thinking. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Okay, he's saying, let's, let's talk this out. Let's use logic. Because logos is from... <laughs> is the word for word, and we get the word logic from that. I want to, let's just line this out and see if we can logically think this through and come to a good conclusion in our life. That's the God of the mind, of the heart. So it says, we are not withholding our affections for you, uh, but you're withholding yours from us. And the word used for affections here is guts intestines. Well, why would they use that? Well, you know, if you're in a ball game, you've ever been in a ball game, or maybe you're going to do public speaking or something, and you're a little nervous before the game starts, before the kickoff. I know I was real nervous in the last Chiefs game I watched, and I, wanted, I had to get on pace far. Well, what's going to happen here? And you feel a little flutters in your stomach, or well, maybe before the kickoff or before the pitch comes to you, uh, or before you're doing something in front of a crowd. And that's what they described as your emotions. And they're saying, you know, we're all for you, Corinthians. We could have gone some other place and not had these troubles, but you know what? We're going to stick it out with you to the end. That was a great love that Paul had for the Corinthians because he knew how much love God had for him. So it's just going to overflow to other people, no matter how bad it got. Never give up. God has a plan. He's in control even when we aren't. And so he says, I'm with you. I'm with you to the end, but you're emotionally um, clogged, so to speak. Emotionally, you've got a, a bowel obstruction, you know, that uh, you can't express your emotions uh, in the right way because you're leading with your emotions. So he says, I want you to lead with your heart. A heart where the thoughts are circulating. And so he says, uh, that's the problem. Your emotions hinder you. And this is true of many believers, emotions hindering them from their walk with Christ. And so you need to turn off your emotions and you can do it anytime you want to. You can be yelling at the dog or, or having a little discussion with your wife or whatnot, back and forth, and the phone rings, you pick up the phone, oh, hi, how you doing? I'm just fine, how are you? You just immediately turned off your emotions. Anyone could do it at any time they want to do it. You can control your emotions if you want to, and you always have to control your emotions in the crisis, because the emotions come, what are we going to do about this? Okay, the society is shutting down, and the jobs are gone, and I'm not going to get paid. i got to pay my bills. And so you think emotionally, first of all. And then you say, okay, wait a minute. What can I do? What do I have in savings? Or, or what kind of part-time job can I have? Or, or what could be the solution? Now you're thinking, and you can solve your problems thinking. But if you just go off on your emotions, you'll never solve any problems. You'll just emote. You get emotional. Now Paul says, a fair exchange. I speak as if to my own children. He speaks to them kindly compassionately, only for their own benefit. Open wide your hearts also. What's he asking them to do? 
to open their minds, to take in God's word, to listen to the teaching and make it a part of their life so that their lives can be straightened out. So that they will not have the animosities and hatreds and jealousies and whatnot that a religious group would have. Remember the religious group on Palm Sunday who said, oh, praise the Lord, you know, blessed be the name of him who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, and then crucify him the same week. Okay, emotions aren't gonna work, all right? You need objective reality, thinking. He gave us a mind to think with. He expects us to use that mind. And rightly dividing the word of God, going into the word of God, making the word of God just a part of our thinking is very important. So to be genuine believers, we have to go with our mind first, our emotions second. If we go emotionally, well, so-and-so didn't like me, or I don't think that's fair, well, not, you're never going to get anywhere. You first have to objectively understand what God has done for you and how much he loves you and cares for you, how he has a plan personally made for your life, and he's going to stick with you to the end. And trust him. And it doesn't really matter what the emotions are or the situations are. Though the fig tree does not blossom and there's no herd in the stall, there's no, uh, the vines have no fruit on them and, and uh, there's no crops or anything, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. It doesn't matter how bad it gets. You're in the hands of God. You will always be safe in the hands of God. No need to panic. No need to fear. You're in his hands and he can take care of it. If he could take the worst incident in the human history, the crucifixion, of the only just man in history. And he turned that into our salvation. What can't he do? He can take your situations, my situations, and he can make it into a beautiful plan of benefit for our life. So, God is able to do far more than we ask or think.